Hi, welcome back to Blockchain Fundamentals with Bill Laboon. Today, we're going to discuss how to use cryptocurrency, and especially what we mean with different, uh, perhaps, uh, words, uh, 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 what are we actually doing on the network. So, throughout this lecture, I'm going to be using uh, Bitcoin as a, an example as it is you know, probably the, the, the largest, uh, certainly the largest and most probably the most well-known of any uh, blockchain technology out there, and certainly the first uh, modern uh, cryptocurrency. Uh, however, a lot of what we're going to discuss here can apply to other blockchains, and I will you know, throughout mention where it differs from, from, uh, from other chains, or what's you know, special about Bitcoin, or what others uh, do slightly differently. So first off, we need to answer the question, what does it mean to own some Bitcoin? Remember, everybody has access to all of the data on the blockchain. So really, you know, owning Bitcoin is going to involve knowing some information that lets you control some of the data on this blockchain. And specifically in terms of Bitcoin, owning it means that you have the ability to control any UTXOs that have been sent to some set of addresses uh, and then generate new transactions from them, which you can uh, prove that you are the rightful owner of, uh, you know, uh, of these uh, UTXOs by signing these transactions with, with the corresponding secret keys for each address. So if this doesn't uh, make sense, I recommend going uh, over uh, the exercise where we uh, generate secret keys and signatures from them. And you can see how anyone can know your public key and thus send funds to it. Uh, however, uh, only the person who knows the private key can send things on from that address or set of addresses. So talking about all of this sort of theoretically, uh, we've always said that uh, a public key, we've really just assumed it is basically an address. Uh, however, in most cryptocurrencies, including Bitcoin, uh, although we can think in a sort of naive way that the public key is really your address, it's actually slightly more complicated than that. Your address uh, is uh, a function of, of, of the public key. So the public key associated with your address, to actually get uh, the address through it, you have to go through, a, at least in Bitcoin, you go through a rather convoluted process, which we'll cover briefly uh, uh, just in a, in a few slides. So if you remember, we talked about the different kinds of uh, transactions uh, on Bitcoin. Generally, what you'll see in a normal transaction is a P2PKH, pay to public key hash, not a straight pay to public key. Uh, for an ordinary user of Bitcoin, you will probably never you know, see uh, the general uh, public key. So uh, other uh, network uh, systems actually uh, you know, can take advantage of this. So for instance, in uh, uh, Polkadot uh, and Kusama, these two network, there are two separate networks, uh, but you can make an address uh, for them uh, based on the same public key. So you could use the same uh, uh, public and private key pair uh, and create a Kusama address and uh, a Polkadot address. Uh, and these addresses will look very different uh, from, an ad, you know, from an address perspective with the user sees, uh, even though behind the scenes, they're really just manifestations of the same uh, public and private key pair. Uh, in Bitcoin, these addresses are generally represented in what's called base 58 check uh, format. So this uh, base 58 check uh, is just a base 58 numbering system with a few extra, uh, few extra uh, uh, twists. So if you remember binary, base two, that just has zero and one, two possible values. Uh, in more rare instances, uh, you'll hear about octal, uh, which has base eight. So things like uh, Unix file permissions use octal. Uh, or hexadecimal, base 16, uh, so 0 uh, up through F. Uh, base 58, just like these, is an extension. It has 58 possible digits, uh, starting from 1 and ending up at Z. Uh, now, the, uh, this 
is case sensitive here. So capital A and lowercase a have different values. And you'll notice there are a few characters missing here. It isn't just all of the numbers and all of the letters. Uh, specifically, uh, capital O, the number zero, lowercase l, and i are omitted. Uh, and this is because uh, when you're writing these down, it can be very uh, confusing. Is this a capital O or a lowercase o or a zero? And so uh, base 58, the simplest way uh, to, to, to eliminate this is to just get rid of the capital O and zero. If you see something that looks like an O, you know that it's a lowercase o. Uh, something similar happened with uh, lowercase l and capital I, since these can be confused for one. So if I see something that looks like a one, I know it is a one and not a lowercase l or capital I. Uh, so interestingly, you'll note uh, sort of the you know, standard uh, non-segwit Bitcoin addresses uh, are, are going to start with a one, uh, which actually means the number zero. Uh, I always thought that, that was interesting. Uh, base 58 check differs from normal uh, base 58 in that there is a checksum at the end. So the last uh, uh, four bytes uh, are actually a checksum to make sure that you entered, uh, entered it properly. But we should remember that a base 58 check number is still a number, which means that we can represent it in all kinds of different ways. So you probably have seen QR codes. Uh, and QR codes, really, you can just think of them as you know, the, the black and the white, uh, you know, the just ones and zeros. And these are... Um, uh, just you know, another representation of a large number. So we hear, see here a, um, a clip from a, a Bitcoin uh, paper wallet here with the address 1MK dot dot dot. And then that exact value also produced as a QR code. We also can produce it uh, in decimal. You know, so it's just a, a standard number or binary, just a sequence of ones and zeros. And all of these really mean the same thing. They can be in just they're displayed in different ways, but all these values, the QR code, uh, 1MK dot dot dot, 557 dot dot dot, 111 dot dot dot, all of these represent the same thing, that, that public address. So we don't uh, really have to go through all of this unless you are, are very interested, uh, but I just want to show you uh, what uh, the process is from going from a public key uh, all the way to, to an address. So first, we're going to take a, an ECDSA key pair. So we're going to generate this key pair, the, you know, the private and public key. We'll keep the private key, then take the public key and get its SHA-256 hash. Uh, we'll then take that hash uh, and then run the RIPEMD160 hash on that to get a, uh, uh, another value. We'll then prepend a zero to this. Remember, this is shown as a one in base 58. Uh, and this just indicates it is a, a standard Bitcoin mainnet address. Uh, so you'll see other uh, uh, prefixes uh, that indicate what network things are on. So like, you know, if, if it is a testnet or a different type of address, like a SegWit address, uh, you'll see different uh, uh, prefixes uh, on it. So now that we've done this, we're going to take the SHA-256 hash of the 0 plus the RIPEMD160 hash, then take the SHA-256 hash of that. So we're going to do a double SHA-256 hash. We take the first four bytes of this last hash and add that uh, to the end of the prepended address found in step four. So what we have is now that that step four plus uh, if you do a double SHA-256 hash on it, you're going to get this final result, uh, which we can use as a checksum. Uh, then we're going to take that original result back in uh, 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 step step four and add that checksum. All right, so the first four bytes of that last SHA-256 hash, after the double SHA-256 hash. And finally, convert that result to base 58 check encoding. So uh, 
you can see that you know part of this the, the, the steps in italics are just for producing the um, uh, the, the, the the checksum so I think this is you know, interesting now anyone can just if you want to you know verify that something is a valid Bitcoin address you can always if given that address just run the SHA-256 hash uh, 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 on, on the, you know, the, the, the value minus the, uh, the checksum, just take the checksum off, run SHA-256 on that twice, and verify that the last four bytes of that hash equals the checksum at the end of the address. So now we've got a, uh, a way to produce Bitcoin addresses, again, other cryptocurrencies uh, and blockchains are going to do similar things, although it may be you know, slightly different uh, from chain to chain. So one of the interesting things you can do it, with this is generate a vanity address. So it's very difficult for me to say you know, that I want a specific address. So if we think about this, this is really almost a variation on the proof of work that Bitcoin does. We're going to run this you know, this multi-hashing process on generated key pairs until we get an address that has some format of what we want. So CS1699 uh, was uh, the, my, my um, uh, class number when I uh, taught this course uh, at university. So if I want to have a Bitcoin address that starts with CS1699, what do I do? Well, Remember, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to figure out uh, what the uh, uh, result of the hash is going to be, especially this multi-hashing process, without, actu without actually running through it. So we're going to have to run through it multiple times until we get the, this text that we want. So we can think of this really as you know, a kind of Bernoulli trial. So again, very similar to, to mining. It's a... Uh, uh, it's a, a hash, um, uh, you're trying to develop a hash that, that gives us the, the right result. And there, is, there are lots of pieces of software out there uh, that can help you do this, but just to understand how it works, uh, again, just like mining, the, best, the easiest way to find the result should be just to keep trying with different inputs. So for every character that we want, these characters are generally uh, random and continuously distributed. So there's a 1 out of 58 chance we'll get the correct character in that slot. So the chances uh, that we want something to, to start with this are uh, 1 over 58 to the kth power for a k character pattern. So you can imagine this would be very difficult to do um, and, and grows very quickly, right? So every time... Uh, that we want to generate you know, one more character in our vanity address that we're going to increase the amount of time it takes on average by 58 times. Now, of course, we always could get lucky or unlucky. It's hard to say exactly how long things will take, um, but uh, definitely will generally take longer uh, the more characters you, you want. Uh, so I have a link to a vanity generator. There are lots of other uh, vanity uh, generators uh, out there. Uh, for Bitcoin, for Ethereum, uh, for all sorts of different uh, blockchains. So I want to show you uh, some, some, some times here uh, as I tried to uh, generate uh, CS1699 to be the first characters of my uh, vanity address. So here uh, you can see I tried to first have it start with one C. So just uh, uh, remember we have to start with one if we're generating a uh, Bitcoin mainnet uh, address here using this, this, uh, the standard uh, format. Uh, so we can see this took 0 0.016 seconds. Very quick. Um, I've got, you know, here's my, my private key. My address is one C. So I started with C. And that took 16 milliseconds. Uh, one CS only took slightly longer. Uh, and in fact, it was actually rounded off uh, in here to the exact same amount of time. Uh, and this is because we're really not looking for that many um, uh, uh, diff different characters here. If we think about this, uh, to get a C, well, on average, we'd have to do you know, uh, 1 half times 1 over 58 
Uh, so one out of every uh, uh, 29. Uh, so we should just be able to produce 29 addresses. That should be very simple, and a modern computer can do that very quickly. Um, now we can see, though, once we start looking for three uh, characters, one CS1, we're starting to get a little bit of extra time here. This took a little over half a second uh, to give me the address 1CS1KOO, uh, whatever. And uh, adding another, uh, another uh, to that, 1CS16, well, now it's uh, uh, 23 seconds. CS169 took over 10 minutes. So you can imagine if you want a very specific address, this is going to take a very, very long time uh, to do. I didn't uh, uh, actually run it, but if getting uh, this many characters, uh, uh, five characters, uh, took us 10 minutes, then we can imagine getting uh, six characters would probably take us about 580 minutes. So multiply by 58 each time we're doing this. Again, we always could get lucky, but generally it's difficult uh, to uh, produce these, and the more characters you want, uh, the more difficult it's, it's going to be. All right, so now you've made your, your vanity address, uh, if you like. Um, you understand what an address is. So how do you store your cryptocurrency? Well, really, storing cryptocurrency is really all about managing uh, your secret. And perhaps if you're interested in maintaining anonymity or a uh, good level of pseudonymity, uh, your public keys perhaps as well. Uh, but there are a variety of ways to do this. And I think the easiest way to categorize them is what trade-offs are made. Because there are always trade-offs being made with how your cryptocurrency is stored. And I think the major uh, trade-offs that we should cover here are availability, that is, you know, how easy is it for you to access uh, the coins there and do things with them or issue transactions uh, from your account. Uh, security, uh, you know, how, how secure is it? Um, and, and finally, convenience, so how easy is it uh, to deal with? So something could be very available, yet still inconvenient. So uh, for instance, if I have to, uh, uh, it, it's, it, it's, I, I have something in my wallet Right. That's uh, however that wallet it, it, you know, could, it could very be easily be stolen. So it has uh, very low security, uh, but it's very available. But it has a horrible user interface. Well, it might not be uh, very convenient uh, to use. Or if I can only do certain things with it. Uh, for instance, uh, with, with paper wallets, really they're uh, send only uh, until you uh, sweep off all of the. Uh, the, the Bitcoin or whatever cryptocurrency from them. And so uh, you can't really do much with them. So while they're, they might be available, they're not very convenient. Um, but let's actually go through some of these instances. Uh, oh, uh, one, uh, sorry, one other thing I wanted to mention here. The, the big differentiation uh, is generally between hot and cold storage. So hot storage means the Generally, the, uh, the pri transactions can be directly made onto the Bitcoin or whatever network, which also generally means that you know, there is network connectivity. You're online. You can do things. Uh, your, your private key is directly accessible on the same computer that the, um, uh, the, the, the network con uh, connection is, is being made. So we can think you know, of, of hot storage as something that's you know, super... Uh, convenient, but we can also realize that the security is not as good because if someone breaks into your computer, then they can uh, take your take your private key uh, or uh, send you know, send your Bitcoin uh, so somewhere else. In cold storage, transactions cannot be directly sent, so your secret keys are not connected uh, to a, to directly to the network. Uh, the, the secret keys are offline. Uh, there are also um, there can be you know various degrees of warm storage. Uh, so it might be, for instance, you know through a proxy. So you uh, don't connect directly to the network, uh, but you have a server that is only accessible through a proxy node or a sentry node. Um, uh, one uh, last thing to remember with since public keys can be you know, uh, transmitted uh, offline. You certainly can create something in cold storage and send it. So you may uh, create a, uh, a Bitcoin address uh, on an air-gapped computer and just write down the, uh, 
the the address and then actually you know people can send uh, funds to that they can send Bitcoin to it but they uh, you will even if it's offline even if it never goes online uh, so you can imagine this this is incredibly uh, secure uh, however there, there are some chains that that don't allow you to do this and the other you know both the uh, receiving and um, in order to receive funds you must also uh, be online so perhaps the hottest uh, and also perhaps least secure uh, kind of wallet is having software on your computer or phone which directly keeps tracks of your keys, makes coin, uh, excuse me, makes transactions, uh, stores your coins, uh, etc. Um, so this is uh, generally considered a bad idea. So while the availability is high and the convenience is very high, uh, since you're, it's, it's immediately available, your computer, you're using it all the time, you don't have to pull anything out. Um, security is extremely low. Uh, because if anyone gets onto your computer and you're storing this, especially if you're storing some, uh, this data uh, in an unencrypted way, then anyone can get your private keys and then they will have access to all of your Bitcoin. So that's generally considered a bad thing. Uh, paper wallets are not uh, as popular as, as they used to be, especially as we've discovered uh, some issues with them. Uh, however, this is basically just generating an address and a secret key. You print it out and just keep it on a piece of paper. Uh, you probably want to, to laminate this um, uh, or you know, otherwise you know, keep it uh, protected. Otherwise, you know, some water might uh, spoil it. Uh, so here we have a lot of, there are a lot of problems with, with uh, paper wallets. Uh, one, uh, they're hard to deal with, right? You can't use these by themselves uh, to send uh, to, to send anything. Uh, you just you have to have some other software which reads this this data in from it. And generally, it's not uh, considered safe to be. You know, once you read something in, to use it as a hot wallet, uh, then you, uh, you know, that that key generally is not considered safe anymore. So these can be used. You know, if you're just sweeping. Uh, a bunch of of funds to them over the course you know over the course of, of some time and then you're moving all of it off at once but generally they're not considered a bad idea they're very excuse me they're not considered a great idea uh, security can be if, if you handle these appropriately can be about medium um, uh, however the availability you know they're quite low they're difficult to deal with they're very inconvenient so this should not be confused with you know, some systems that let you write down or store your private key, uh, excuse me, your, uh, a private like seed phrase. So this uh, seed phrase, uh, which you use you know, for hardware wallets and some other uh, uh, systems, can regenerate your, um, uh, all of the addresses that, that you use. However, uh, this seed phrase uh, is generally used in conjunction with some other uh, system. So seed phrases are not paper wallets. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more uh, about them when we talk about hardware wallets. But they're just, they're not, I want to make sure people understand, those are not, in fact, uh, uh, paper wallets. So brain wallets, uh, remember that when we produce a... Uh, an ECDSA key pair. We're getting some randomness from the system. Well, if we, and computers are very bad at getting actual randomness. So we, uh, instead of that, uh, what computers do generally is pseudo-randomly generate something, given a seed. And this seed will be usually be something like uh, the number of milliseconds since the epoch, uh, or generate some system randomness, uh, you know, from, you know, like, what the order that threads went in or the, the key presses that you've done or something like that. However, if we can override this seed, uh, you know, enter um, some uh, passphrase that we remember, then uh, run SHA-256 on that passphrase, well, we, are, we can get a new seed that lets us generate our own uh, Bitcoin address with a private key. So this seems like really great, right? Uh, this, this passphrase can be entirely in your head. Um, it doesn't have to ever go onto a computer. You can make, um, you could even calculate all of, if you really want to, if you're really paranoid, uh, calculate it by hand or at least do it uh, in an air-gapped way. Uh, 
However, you know, you'll notice there there's a warning about choosing a strong passphrase. And it turns out humans are horrible at coming up with enough randomness um, to, uh, uh, to come up with a, with a good enough passphrase. So they, remember that all of this data, all Bitcoin addresses that store any funds are somewhere on the network, which means that anyone can essentially spend an unlimited amount of time uh, trying to break them. And in fact, quite a few people have done this. Uh, they've just you know, run different passphrases, run different uh, sections of books or you know, passwords or various things until they find um, a Bitcoin address that they now have access to. So brain wallets have the, the benefit of uh, being able to be stored in your head or, or written down. Uh, however, using a seed phrase uh, is going to have some other uh, benefits that we'll dis discuss uh, a, a little bit later. Uh, the other thing is, if you have even one letter wrong here, so if you have like an extra space at the end of, you know, when you type this in, CS6991699 is the best class ever, space or period or exclamation point, you're going to get an entirely different uh, value here, an entirely different address. So it is really prone uh, to mistakes, and it's hard to do things with. It's very, and it's hard for humans to come up with it with a good enough passphrase that it will resist. Excuse me, all of the attacks that can be made on this public blockchain throughout all of time. So generally, we consider brain wallets to be very low availability, very low in convenience, and generally low to medium in security. So if you do everything correctly and you can come up with a phrase uh, or something you can remember that was not used by anyone and you do everything you know, perfectly correctly, it's hard for anyone else to guess, uh, then we have medium security. But that's really hard to even get uh, to that point. So brain wallets, not something that uh, are really uh, in fashion uh, right now. So hardware wallets are kind of considered for, for an ordinary user uh, probably the best trade-off between availability and, and security that we have. So these are generally simple devices. They tend not to be like you know, what we would think of as a, a full computer, uh, which generate keys, they sign transactions, but the secret keys never leave the device. They have very limited input and output. Uh, so transactions are, are fed in from your computer. They'll connect via like USB or something like that, or via um, you know just displaying QR codes. They've got very limited... Um, uh, connectivity with the actual network. Uh, they're signed locally on, the, on the, the hardware wallet and then the signed transaction is output. Uh, so basically, uh, from your perspective, what you would do if you want to use a hardware wallet would be something like uh, and you buy one of these, enter your password, uh, run some software to send a transaction uh, on your computer, plug in the hardware wallet to, to sign it, uh, enter you know your passphrase or whatever on the actual hardware wallet and then send send it out over the network so these are a little bit annoying slightly annoying because you need to have the actual uh, uh, hardware wallet with you to use it um, but so that's why availability and convenience I have it at medium uh, but uh, security is extremely high and they're, they're not that difficult uh, to, to deal with once you're just used to. Uh, it's just like carrying your wallet around. You have a, a hardware wallet uh, uh, that, that you have. So uh, I remember when I first got into uh, uh, Bitcoin, uh, I was thinking to myself, well, what happens when that hardware wallet fails? What happens if I dunk it into water or just, you know, there's, there's some sort of software glitch or uh, I get really angry at it and throw it against the wall? Uh, so generally what you can do is when you first generate, uh, uh, when you first get a hardware wallet and you generate an address, start ge before you generate addresses rather, you can get a, a, a seed phrase fed out to you. So remember we talked about this with brain wallets. Uh, this seed phrase is going to allow you to generate all of the data back on the, uh, the hardware wallet. So you would be, if you get a new one, uh, and these all follow a pretty standard protocol. So even if the company goes out of business, there are other ways of, of using the seed phrase. Um, you then can uh, have access to that uh, uh, wallet on, on a different uh, hardware wallet. So you need to keep the seed phrase safe. Um, 
However, it, this differs from a brain wallet in, in that the, uh, the, the phrase is generated for you, so it's going to have a lot more randomness than something you come up uh, with on your own. And generally, these also have uh, checksums. So uh, if you, you know, try to enter in an invalid word, for instance, uh, you know, or you have a word list that you can you know, verify what are the particular words used. So they tend to be a, a lot easier and tend to be the recommended way uh, for, for most users of cryptocurrency to hold, uh, hold their coins. Uh, so remember I said that these uh, hardware wallets will let you produce you know, more than one address. Uh, some blockchains are uh, more you know, open and willing uh, to, to use the same address over and over again. So for instance, uh, Ethereum, uh, in order to avoid state bloat, they really encourage you to use uh, the same address. Uh, however, Bitcoin, especially because it is UTXO based and not account based, um, is going to really encourage you to not reuse uh, addresses. And the reason for this is having a single address, if we're worried about anonymity, is generally a bad idea. It's going to leak information about your identity. If you've been sending transactions all of your life to the same address, well, if anyone links that address to you, they know, all right, this person has this much Bitcoin uh, in this. Uh, it also allows people to you know, um, perhaps uh, figure things out about you. If you are always uh, uh, using a Bitcoin between 8 a.m., uh, and 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time, people might think, all right, well, this person is probably in, um, in the USA, uh, or perhaps they're a night ride, you know, they, they're a very night, uh, night owl in uh, Japan, uh, for instance. Uh, or, you know, any, anyone, remember, everything, all of this is public on, on Bitcoin or in most blockchains. Uh, so if you're always paying your landlord from the same address, well, now they know, uh, they, they can look back and see what your, uh, you know, how much money you have and how much they can then ask, uh, ask uh, you know, for you and, and raise your rent. So generating new addresses, uh, you know, in all, for all practical purposes, infinite, obviously not really infinite, but, you know, a huge number, more than anyone would be able to use in their lifetime. You know, why don't we uh, try with Bitcoin to reuse these addresses? So again, other systems uh, are less uh, open to this. So one thing that is actually a problem with Bitcoin are these dust addresses, addresses that have such a small amount of Bitcoin that it's not even worth it to move it anymore. And this is going to take up space uh, on the blockchain uh, for, for all time. And uh, so some other systems like you know, Polkadot has the concept of an existential deposit. So if you have an address with less than a certain amount, you know, 0.001 uh, dots, for instance, then that address will simply get wiped uh, from, from the network. So uh, some, something like this doesn't work quite as well for other systems, but uh, certainly for Bitcoin, it makes sense uh, not to reuse addresses. And most wallets will allow you to automatic, most wallet software will allow you to automatically just keep creating new uh, addresses. Uh, so... This is often done with uh, a certain uh, uh, process uh, called uh, BIP32 uh, to create hierarchical deterministic wallets. So here, you know, we're going to generate a, a single, from a single seed, we can make a series of addresses which from the out, to the outside world look unlinked, uh, but to which the, the wallet software is going to have uh, access to. Uh, we actually even can then, uh, you know, have our transactions come from multiple addresses. Remember, we can do this when we're creating a Bitcoin uh, transaction. We can have uh, input uh, different UTXOs from different uh, uh, addresses into a new, uh, a new output. So this allows us to have one seed, but many addresses that we can deterministically recreate. Okay, the last uh, thing I really want to discuss today is splitting and sharing keys. So let's first start with a real problem uh, here. And the real problem is my wife uh, does not like the fact that I uh, spent Bitcoin, uh, bought several different uh, cryptocurrency related sweaters. Uh, so we decided that we 
are both going to have veto power over our spending. So that if I think she's spending too much money on Bitcoin uh, dresses, and, uh, which she actually does have a Bitcoin dress, uh, and I'm spending too much money on Bitcoin sweaters, uh, we want us you know, to have veto power. How can we do this in Bitcoin? Each have veto power over the other person's spending ability. So the naive way to do this is just take some, uh, he, we're going to put all of our funds into one public address, and I'm going to have half the secret key, and she's going to have the other. So I know the red part here, the 5J1 dot dot dot. She has the blue part, G-A-Z dot dot dot. Um, and we have to put them together in order to actually sign anything. So there are, of course, a, uh, a few problems with, with this scenario. Uh, one, uh, it's kind of a pain. We're going to have to you know, enter the, this manually. I can look over at her uh, part of the secret key and perhaps figure uh, some of it out. Uh, if uh, uh, it's going to be easier for me to crack, right? I've, uh, I know a huge part of what the, uh, the key is. I've, you remember how much longer it took to calculate a, um, a key or a public address based on how many characters we know? Well, I've already got uh, you know, half of the characters here uh, down. I've only got half to go. So I've really reduced by orders of magnitude uh, the amount of computation I might have to do to, to get uh, uh, access to this account and go and buy my excuse me, Bitcoin sweaters. So we can see you know, there, there are some problems with this naive approach. It does have the benefit of, of simplicity, however. Uh, it also, it's, it's very limited, right? So if I were involved in perhaps a, a more complicated uh, relationship where there are three of us, uh, perhaps a, um, uh, you, a, a, you know, a group of three or you know, parents and, and, a ch and, and children, uh, or if we want to have uh, some you know, more complicated way of coming to a consensus instead of uh, all of us having to agree. All right, so... Like, let's say here, uh, you know, I've got values k and n. Uh, k is less than n, less than or equal. And can we split the key into n pieces? So if we have k shares, we can determine the key. But what we don't want is if having, we don't want any number of shares to give enough knowledge to guess the key. So uh, what I mean by this is I don't want, if I don't have enough shares to actually do the transaction, then I should be in the same position as someone not having any of these uh, shares of, of the key. So uh, can we do this? Can we do something like you know, best you know, two out of three people uh, need to, uh, to have this? Or uh, could we split up uh, a key into a hundred group, a hundred pieces? We couldn't do that with our naive splitting. We don't, didn't have a hundred characters. So one way uh, uh, to do this uh, in a more complicated way uh, is just generate some random value and XOR it, exclusive OR it, uh, with the initial key. And then together, uh, so we now have two shares. We have some, some R and then S XOR R. So R is just an entirely random or pseudo-randomly generated value. That's not going to help us. And S, X, or R, if we don't know R, is also going to look essentially like a random value. It's only if we have R and S, X, or R together that we can X, or this again and get the actual key. And we can do this um, just... Uh, you know, just extrapolate it outwards with, with more, more XORs, uh, more ran, uh, random values, uh, but N has to equal K in this scenario. So it's really useful if you want to do uh, 3 of 3 or 4 of 4 signing, but it really falls down. There's no way, if you're missing any of these, you're not going to be able to actually calculate uh, the secret key. So it really falls down once uh, we get to the point where uh, you know, we want to do best two out of, th or uh, two agree out of three, or five out of seven, or anything like that. So what do we do if we want our k value to not equal our n value? Which, you know, we can see this uh, actually occurring in, in a lot of places, right? So I want to make sure that my son gets my Bitcoin upon my death. 
uh, or uh, you know, if uh, you know, uh, uh, we decide that he has come into an inheritance, uh, well, if my, both my wife and I agree that you know we can send you know give this uh, uh, Bitcoin to my son, and if it's only going to be me and my wife, then that's fine. But what if you know I'm dead? Then she is not going to be able to send this. So why don't we have you know my lawyer has one share uh, here. Uh, I do. I have one share. My wife has one share. And any two of us. So if if my wife dies, my lawyer and I can uh, send the Bitcoin to my son. Uh, if my wife and I agree he's coming to an, his inheritance, uh, we can both together uh, do it. Or if I die, then my wife and my, law and my lawyer uh, can, can send the funds. Or uh, you, know, you need at least two members of a board to agree to spend money from a corporation's Bitcoin account. Uh, or five out of nine justices are acting uh, to pay out Bitcoin in escrow. So we can see there are a lot of different cases where we might want to uh, uh, use this in, in real life, so in, in actuality. Uh, however, using our naive splitting or our, um, uh, our XOR process, this is not going to be impossible. We needed K to equal N. So there is another uh, interesting uh, thing based on uh, slopes of a line, an intercept. So this is a, a Chimir secret sharing scheme. So the idea behind this. So let's say our secret key is five. And I realize you know, this is a very you know, small number, but just to make the math easier. Um, what we can do is uh, send out, if we want to do, let's say, two of three here. So this is a, you know, we need two of, of three to agree with it. Uh, share sub one. Uh, gets the point three eight, so they just know this point. Share sub two knows negative three uh, negative three uh, two, and share sub three has a negative seven negative two. So any one of these um, uh, uh, points, you're not going to be able to calculate the slope from. Right, our slope is y equals x plus five. Again, very simple. Imagine the numbers are bigger for a real, uh, a real Bitcoin address. Uh, however, if so, if I have two or more points on the line, then I can calculate that intermediate value. So I can pass, you know, calculate a hundred of these shares. But as long as two people uh, have them and come together and agree, they can together figure out uh, the actual uh, intercept. So if you just have one point, you know, there are all kinds of different uh, uh, slopes that could be coming from that point. You know, I mean, really, essentially, an infinite number. Uh, although, in, in, with with you know with this discrete math that, that's modular, you know, we do have some limits, but it's going to be uh, essentially infinite. If you can't determine the slope, you can't determine the intercept, which means you don't know the key. But as soon as you have two of these, you can calculate the slope and thus the intercept and thus get the key. And you say, well, that's all very well and good, but what if I want three of n? Well, here we just need to increase the order of the function of the, of the polynomial. So here we've got y equals x squared plus five, and I pass these points out. And the only way to determine where this uh, parabola intercepts is if you have three or more points on it. So here I've got a three of four sharing scheme, uh, by uh, having you know, three, four different points, as long as you know three of them, you're able to reproduce that parabola. Uh, otherwise, you can't. And then you know, we can uh, stretch that out just with you know, higher order functions. So we're going to determine the key, then uh, d determine k. So uh, what is the minimum number of, uh, of shares that would be needed to... Uh, unlock the funds. All right, so now create some k minus one order polynomial which intersects the origin at zero comma key. So somewhere uh, at, uh, somewhere along that line, uh, there there is a uh, along that axis rather, you know, there is an inter intercept point. We then determine n random points in the function, and 
uh, distribute those n random points. So here uh, we've got this, this cool concept that we can now set k and n to whatever we want, and they're very easily calculated as long as you have at least uh, k of these shares. And if you don't have uh, k, if you only have k minus 1, then you actually uh, don't have any additional information uh, to help you break the, the code, uh, unlike uh, what we had with our, our naive uh, sharing scheme. So this is a, a really cool process, but the problem is, of course, at some point here, we are generating the actual secret key. So there are other ways uh, that we're not going to go into here, but I just want you to, to know that these do exist. Um, a way for everybody to make partial signatures. And so you never have to have the secret key uh, actually generated until you are uh, actually uh, uh, signing off on something. So you never reveal the key. Uh, you, every user can sign the transaction, uh, and the key was never produced in one uh, uh, single place. So what we have been talking about so far has been actually you know, using uh, and sending your coins yourself. But not everybody uh, always does this. Uh, and is a, uh, a good idea uh, to, you know, to, to keep track of your own keys because not your keys, it's not your coins. Uh, however, there are online wallets, both uh, exchanges uh, you know, where somebody will keep track of this for you and you have to trust uh, that, that exchange. Uh, there are um, online wallets that uh, you can access or even access online uh, that require no installation on your part. You just need to enter in your key somehow and store that offline and the, the code uh, will work for you. So they're sort of non-custodial. Um, uh, but... Uh, there are, you know, possible security worries when, when using when using these, but they are uh, uh, very, very uh, convenient. Uh, so uh, an exchange is not just a, a is different from an online wallet, and that they also allow you to buy and sell Bitcoin. Uh, just they act just like a stock exchange. So you know, I'll give you you know whatever this much money for a share of stock, or I'll give you this much money for one uh, this much fiat money uh, for one Bitcoin. So. Uh, this is really convenient because you can buy uh, a Bitcoin or other cryptocurrency and store it. Um, but of course, you're, you're offloading your responsibility. So part of the, the, the benefit of cryptocurrency is that you can verify everything. You're obviously not going to be able to do this uh, if the, on the online exchange is handling all of this. And there are also other risks, such as you know, they may be fractional reserve. Uh, which means they may not have all the Bitcoin that they say they do. Uh, and since there's only a limited number of Bitcoin in, in the world, remember only 21 million will ever be produced, uh, then actually slightly less than that, uh, there, there, were a few, there were a few known instances of, of certainly lost Bitcoin and burned Bitcoin. Um, so it, it can be a, a problem if you, if you trust them to, to have it without proof. So, uh, for instance, uh, there are you know there are some risks uh, with withholding uh, your your currency your cryptocurrency on an exchange. So first is an exchange run. So if lots of P if for a regular bank uh, they never generally have as much money on hand as they uh, you have know, loaned out. So if enough people ask for that money back, then uh, the bank might not have enough cash on hand. If rumors then spread that the bank doesn't have money, everybody goes to try to cash out, causing even more of a problem. So in the United States and in many other countries, bank accounts are backed uh, by something. So, uh, for instance, uh, the Federal Depository Insurance uh, Corporation in the U.S., uh, this shouldn't happen. So if, if a bank does fail, anyone that has a bank account is going to get up to, I think, $250,000 reimbursed. Um, but this is because they can always, the government can always print more money, uh, but you can't print more Bitcoins. So you can imagine this could be more problematic. Uh, it could be that there's, you know, this is an exit scam, that this exchange isn't really running uh, uh, Bitcoin, isn't planning to give it back to you. There have been several cases uh, where uh, founders have run off 
uh, with the Bitcoin in an exchange. Uh, and even uh, for some of these, uh, they, there's it seems like everything is working because uh, people get their Bitcoin back by others who are depositing Bitcoin at first. But eventually, uh, these Ponzi schemes uh, will, you know, will eventually fall apart. And finally, a hacker could break into the exchange's software. Uh, you know, they, they could you know, hack into their account and move all the Bitcoin. And if that happens, you know, there's no CEO of Bitcoin uh, to figure out, oh, right, this was stolen from this person. Remember, our concept of ownership is, do you have the private keys to that address? Uh, and if someone takes those private keys from you, moves it to a different address, well, according to the rules of Bitcoin, I'm not talking about morality here, I'm just talking about the internal rules of Bit or legality, just the internal rules of Bitcoin. Bitcoin considers that uh, to be you know, yours. You have the right to do with it what, what you want. And you know, a hacker could also break into your own computer software, and in fact, you know, it might be up to you. Do you trust the, uh, uh, the exchange operator to take better control of your keys than you yourself would? Uh, but there's certainly, uh, you know, exchanges are sort of you know, uh, painting a, uh, a target, uh, right, uh, for to be to be attacked because you know, that's where all the Bitcoin is, right? So there's a famous line supposedly said by a bank robber uh, when asked, "Why do you rob banks?" Well, that's where the money is. So why would you try to rob exchanges? You know, that's where the Bitcoin is, not in you know some account with with a tenth of a Bitcoin in it. But if you can uh, access uh, you know, one of an exchange's accounts that may have, uh, you know, millions of dollars worth of Bitcoin in it, you know, they're certainly going to get to go there. Uh, so, so thank you. Hopefully this has given you a better idea of uh, the process of uh, using Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies.